Hi everyone, it's Kirk and Michael for this week's edition of The Rundown. Uh, this week's rundown, we're going to focus on some lessons we've been learning recently. Mm -hmm. I know uh, privately we have shared with some of our, our through videos and, and communications with our clients that um, we've, been, we've lost a lot of clients recently. Um, a lot. I mean, I, I don't even know where we're at now in the last six months. It's, it's a, lot, a lot of clients in their 50s and 60s and 70s. Um, and then we're having a lot of our clients' parents passing away. And we're learning some lessons. Um, through experience gains lessons. The whole concept of the, the business model we created, Michael, was to create this sort of family office mm -hmm. for those clients, you know, that one to $10 million client. Now we have clients worth more. But that core one to $10 million client that does not have access to that family office type of planning, taxes, efficiencies, attorney, legal, legacy. So, um, but what we're learning is that we need to do a better job of helping our clients to communicate to their family, their children and their parents of their wishes, what their plans are, what they want to happen so that we don't have problems when someone passes away or inherits money. Someone inherits money and the plan we've designed, a really efficient tax plan is set up for the rest of their lives and how they're going to leave money to their children or not is all set up and then they inherit a bunch of money that they didn't really know about. They mm -hmm. didn't know the types of assets and it throws a big wrench into this really efficient plan we spent at, by that point, hundreds of hours on, right? Yeah, I mean, I know the class tends to focus on retirement planning for you and your plan. Yes. And people at first kind of tend to just kind of hand wave the family office dynamic of, yeah, 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 I know it's important. I mean, how many people come to the class and we ask, have you, do you have a trust yet? And they go, well, no, it's on the list to get done. And it has been for the past 10 years. It's on everyone's list to get done because that estate planning is always back of mind, the back burner. I'll get there eventually. Right. And when we're helping build a plan for someone, the focus is on the plan. And if there's a goal to leave legacy to your kids, that's one thing. But the family office approach really kind of gets put on the back burner until it becomes necessary. That's the interesting part, Michael, right? So we're all assuming, even us, when we're building a plan, you're going to live a long life. But we're having people dying in their 50s, 60s, and 70s. Mm -hmm. And we've got kids, we've got younger kids. So we've got the parents that we're inheriting money from that's creating a problem because we didn't help our clients get their parents involved with the attorney, their attorney, our attorney coordinating mm -hmm. things. But the kids, so the kids are starting, some of your kids are starting to hit full stride in their careers, in their lives, financially feeling very literate and overconfidence often, as you probably know with your children, I know my children, right? No, sincerely. So by the time something happens to you, those children have their, their attorney or they have their financial advisor or their financial beliefs. And so, or even worse is we met someone recently who they had, they had two children. One was in the financial advising business. One was in law school. And they disaster. were worth somewhere in the range of $5 million. Yes. They were trusting their 21-year-old child who's in the financial wealth management space and their 23-year-old child who was in law school to be their advisor and their attorney. It was a, it was a mess. I, I just, <laughs> so whether it's just not coordination of people who, parents, attorneys, CPAs, your attorney, CPA, or you're trusting your kids too much to guide you, it can cause some real problems down the road. Well, here's the problem is if one of the, parents pass away. Mm -hmm. So one of you passes away and then your California son or your uh, Colorado daughter or wherever they're coming in from with their own advisor ideas and attorneys, there's no relationship with us yet because we haven't done a good enough job. That's mm -hmm. one of the lessons we're learning with your children. You didn't do a good enough job communicating with your kids about your plan and that everything's mapped out. What's supposed to happen when one dies versus the other dying, when they both die, how it's going to the kids, it's all mapped out. What's happening is we have one child coming in disrupting the whole plan for mom who has it all mapped out and it's such a great plan and paying really little taxes. And of course, you know, 
oh, they've got annuities, they must be bad, or they don't understand all the pieces to the puzzle because, and it's our fault, we haven't done a good enough job engaging with your children, we haven't done a good, good enough job helping you get your parents engaged with, I don't even care if it's with us, but at least from, the, from our attorney, so that things come to you properly, we have to educate you, and in, in, as, as we're experiencing all this, Michael started doing a lot of research around this mm -hmm. and learned a lot of interesting statistics. Michael, I know you want to share, and wait for today's homework because I think you guys are going to enjoy this one. But Michael, share some of the data that we've learned of the mess of the 70 plus trillion dollars is passing to the next generation and how disruptive it is for the surviving spouse and then when they're both gone and the mistakes the kids are making. Well, that is so you nailed it. So the baby boomers, as a result of a lot of hard work and some fortunate market bull run timing here, they are the wealthiest generation of all time. And For it's sure. not even close. $70 trillion being passed from the baby boomers to Gen X and, and millennials and all the way down the line. And if it's done improperly, it just causes nightmares for everyone. So there's a ton of data and a lot of statistics I want to get through today. Um, the statistics themselves are not as important. It's more or less us trying to throw darts, a lot of different darts in a lot of different areas because I know people's tendency to hear one or two data points or statistics and go, well, that's not me. So they ignore yeah. the whole point. Something in all of this applies to someone out there. That's the bottom line. 100%. Everyone has to have a plan on how their, have a guideline, a path on how their plan is connected if they have surviving parents who are still around, and then how their plan is gonna be passed on to their kids. Even people with max income plans, there's, some, yes. there's gonna be something left at the end, and if you just drop that on your kids' laps without them understanding what it is, how it got there, how they should handle it. Time out, Michael. They're gonna make mistakes. Yes, they're gonna, now, it, it doesn't matter how smart they are. It doesn't matter what they do in their profession. They're not going to understand your plan unless we help them to understand. They're not going to understand why the, all the things you're doing and why it's important when one of you dies, the other one is taken care of. So we are so, we feel so strongly about this now that we're making some policy changes for, in our practice requiring, requiring mm -hmm. our clients, they're going to have to use Mark Wander, our state planning attorney. They're going to have to use Don Yasky, and I'm, I'm buying a CPA firm right now so we can support everyone. People going forward as we bring on new clients, they have to use our attorney and CPA because we're, we're in court. There's too many messes, too many family issues. We're seeing too many problems. We're going to help. That family office is critical with the wealth you all have. It's critical. Michael, share some statistics. Sure. So let's jump in here. So first and foremost, an obvious one, 85% of people plan to leave an inheritance of some type to their, their kids or to a charity. When we say inheritance, it does not have to be your kids. Sure. It can be charities, foundations, the kids, other family, nieces, nephews, whoever. Sure. 85% of people plan to leave something. 37% of people have a plan. And <laughs> I would love, of the 37% of people who said, yeah, I have a plan, I would pay to see what their plan looks like. Yeah, I'd love to see that, Michael. So they're counting a plan is, oh, they have powers of attorney, they have health care directives, and maybe they have a will. Yes. That's their plan. That's not a plan. And their plan involves the 4% rule or the 3.3% yeah. rule yes. and all that nonsense. Yes. So there has to be not just a plan, there has to be a really good plan put Correct. in place that's tied in with your retirement plan. That's number one. Number two, so this has been, we've been seeing this in our practice. This is a, a national study. 56% of people have decided that they want to start providing a living legacy. Yeah, this is a big trend, Michael. We've um, been seeing this. I mean, this is five years ago. This study had 37% of people wanting to do this. Today, it's 56. I'm going to so restate there's... that. I'm going to restate what you just said. Five years ago, because we're feeling this and witnessing this. Every meeting mm -hmm. that we're taking, every new client we've taken on here recently, it's consistent. Well, I shouldn't say every. The pattern we're witnessing where it wasn't as much of a priority that living legacy 30 uh, years ago, they, they were, at least for our clients, it was about leaving a legacy for the children. I think one of the reasons we're seeing a trend towards more, let's have a living legacy. Let's, let's share the wealth while we're alive, partially because we've done a better job of educating our clients yeah. that they're not going to outlive their income and they can afford to spend more. I totally agree. And so we tell people all the time, 
in terms of legacy planning, a really common approach that people without a plan take is they set aside a million bucks, two million bucks yes. as like a lump sum at the end. And in, in their brain, they're thinking, okay, if I pass away 86, which is average for men, or 88, which is average for women, and I need some long-term care, I can tap into that million, two million dollar lump sum at the end, and I'll be fine for myself. If I don't live that long, if I don't need long-term care, then good for the kids, that's for them. Yes. But we've gotten a lot better at messaging and educating, educating people on there are better ways to approach long-term care safety nets, um, longevity risk if you live for a long time, and legacy for the kids. So people are now realizing, oh, you know what? I don't want to leave my kids a million bucks each when they're 65. I would much rather give them $10,000 each per year between 35 and 60. Or I'd rather help them buy their first house, buy their car, pay off student loans, pay for a wedding. Well, a lot Things of vacations, that are happening now. A lot of family vacations with the grandchildren yes. where they're paying for. I, we, we love seeing that. I think one of our new things we're going to do, Michael, is ask our clients as they're traveling to send us photos of wherever they're traveling. Yeah. And we might even post that up on our website or Facebook or, or somewhere so our clients can experience the retirement our people are. It's amazing that the retirements people are living right now. But and go so ahead. To your, to your point earlier, why do we think that the living legacy goal is becoming more popular? It's not that people's goals are changing. It's that the education is changing. I think so. Recognizing, oh, this is not possible. So reasons why people are are giving for shifting towards a, a living legacy is 81% they want to see the heirs enjoy the money while they're alive. Yep. 72% they want to teach the heirs lessons with the money. Yeah, we can help with that. We, we're not doing a good enough job. The lessons that you all could be teaching with your children, your adult children, which isn't easy to teach them lessons, by the way. Um, we can help you with that. We can plant the right seeds and have the right type of uh, um, webinars and things that we can extend down through the parents to the kids we can help with that and we should be doing a better job we will so that the kids aren't inheriting what you've worked hard and saved for and they're trading tesla options and they lose the whole thing in, in a month because they weren't taught how to properly manage this stuff uh cryptos. So, <laughs> cryptos. crypto uh, pick your poison um, 72 percent want to pay for the heirs education 71 percent want to help the heirs pursue a passion or a business so if if one of the kids is trying to get a business off the ground but they feel like they can't pursue that because they've got bills of their own to pay you can step in and help the kids uh, 73 percent want, want to make sure they're taken care of if they pass away unexpectedly mm -hmm. people assume well you know I'll start talking to the kids when when I'm 70 when I'm 75 when I'm 80 we just don't get to make that choice. <laughs> I've had a couple just brutal meetings in the past two months where it's been people who have passed away unexpectedly in their late 50s, early 60s. Just brutal meetings because built a plan, it's a fantastic plan, the plan goes until their 90s and then they're gone. It's horrible. I, I am convinced, Michael, we ought to share if, and I think one of them might, because I think uh, one of them is a nurse, and I think she would would love to share, I think we're gonna ask, the experience that she went through to help others avoid that experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, sincerely, for years we've been telling people they need to retire. You know, when we say no to somebody, because we only help about 40% of the people want our help. The 60% we're saying no to are people who are unwilling to surrender and let us help them. And I think about all those people that didn't let us help them I know how many of ours are dying and having health events and mm -hmm. bad outcomes and they just missed it because they refused to just accept I won the lottery I won it I can be done and they're refusing to accept it and it just I don't I think everyone thinks it doesn't happen to them everyone That's thinks the, that way the assumption everyone thinks that way so here's some more data on a different topic here in, involving the relationship between the parents and the kids. So 53% heirs have no, have no idea how much I have. Now that in and of itself is not necessarily a problem. The kids don't, know, don't need to know the numbers. They don't need to know is your net worth a million, two, three, four, whatever. But they need to know that there's a plan in place, a structure in place, yes. so that whenever mom and dad do pass, Maybe the number is a surprise to the kids, but they know that what they're receiving is a result of a highly structured, highly efficient plan. 
that you all, I mean, for our clients, they've invested in this plan, right? We forced it, right? Mm -hmm. Not only did they spend eight hours of education in a class, but we pushed them, we forced them to watch a 30 minute educational TV show every two weeks throughout the retirement. Like they have, and then in addition, they've, they've earned those dollars. They worked 40 years of the life. So they have a significant investment in their money and their retirement plan to not communicate with your children is a shame when we look at the statistics of 85% of kids blow the money in 19 months after you're dead. Yeah, so a couple other reasons here why people don't talk to the kids or, or the result of not talking to the kids. 42% of heirs don't know where all the accounts are. How many people have come to see us after a class or at a class and they have accounts at five, 10, 15, 20 different institutions. They've got three accounts at Fidelity, four at Schwab, two at TD. They've got some at, all over the place. It's insane. Yes. And they tell themselves that they do that intentionally because they wanna be diversified across companies, which is insane, don't have time for that today. But imagine now, okay, you pass away. Now the kids need to go track down accounts at 10 different institutions. You're missing a whole step. It's Michael. a nightmare. Forget the kids. How about the, the surviving, surviving spouse? spouse? Yes. And that's when the kids get involved and then it gets really a mess. And but I laugh, I shouldn't say I laugh, but when both spouses are there and the, and the do-it-yourselfer says, oh, well, I have, a, I have a spreadsheet at home and we review it once a month. And the, the spouse who's not the do-it-yourselfer rolls their eyes and says, honey, I don't pay attention when we're doing our spreadsheet once a month conversation. I don't know where all of our accounts are. I don't know where to even find that spreadsheet. Let alone when you die and I'm 80 years old, I'm not even gonna be able to read the darn spreadsheet. Yes. I haven't looked at a spreadsheet in 40 years. That's what you're gonna leave me as a spreadsheet? 48% uh, have not shared their most recent will with their heirs and 33% don't know how, be, how it'll be d divided. Now, that last one, that's a personal preference. But in terms of, okay, so now both parents and mom and dad have passed, the kids don't know what the most recent will or it should be a trust says there are surprises about how it's being split so now you're gone and whether you meant to or not you are surprising the kids with the number that's left at the end how it's being split and now you're causing fights so michael we i know we're experiencing this and i don't want to go into too much detail but we've experienced this a couple of times where where um mom and dad both pass away and mm -hmm. they uh, before mom and dad passed away, one of the children predeceased them. Mm -hmm. And one of the children yeah. have children. Yeah. And everyone's wishes are a little different, but I can tell you the grandchildren and the whatever surviving spouse of your sibling who died first was expecting an inheritance. Mm -hmm and isn't always getting an inheritance, and it isn't always clear in this, tends to find our way into court, tends to find our way into issues, that's a problem. That's a problem. That's why communication and education to your kids and your parents about everything is really important. Yeah, I mean, we, to you, that's a good point. We tend to think about this in terms of the people we're helping and their kids, but this also applies to your parents. 100%. Because they're gonna be leaving you with either a, a bunch of problems if it's not taken care of properly or resources that may or may not be in the plan that can throw the plan off from a tax planning perspective an income perspective yes a lot of different ways 100 percent so let's just, let's skip through the numbers here some of the reasons why people don't discuss this with the kids it's not a pressing issue they don't want to appear greedy um, they don't like to talk about these financial things with family it's a, it's a depressing topic not sure how to bring it up I mean, not to sound rude, but these are all excuses. It's important. It's got to be talked about to some capacity. Well, I, I, part of the problem is, is that, you know, they, again, you, they're, they're communicating with friends. Mm -hmm. uh, they're reading articles. And they're, they keep putting themselves in that I'm an average retiree right. category. And maybe the average retiree who's only saved $200,000 for retirement and really aren't going to, there's not going to be much left at the end. Well, those people aren't probably communicating and may not need to communicate as much with their children, but mm -hmm. you're not an average baby boomer. So those general rules and articles and what your friends are saying, it's different. You need to communicate. And Michael, I want to be clear because I think some people are a little anxious about communicating specific numbers. And you said it earlier, 
And we're going to talk about this in a minute, how we're going to help you with this. Because we are going to help you. Because this is our responsibility to help them. Mm -hmm. that you don't have to communicate specific numbers, but you certainly need to communicate the plans that are in place and what's supposed to happen and when so they understand the mechanics of what mom and dad did, when dad dies, what mom's going to do, if, da if mom dies, what dad's going to do, and then when they both die, what your wishes are for your dollars to happen. Mm -hmm. Right? So that communication can be done without specifically saying numbers. So it's important. It's, it's critical. And that, that's probably the, one, the biggest pushback we get from people is saying, well, I don't want the kids to know the numbers because I don't want to take away their drive to work hard because I don't want them to bank on the, retire, on the, on a, on the inheritance. I don't want to cause any tension with them or whatever. And I totally get that. So we, we can teach these things, these concepts, without telling them the numbers, the net worth numbers. 100%. Well, we will. Michael, what's the last thing before we get to uh, they say? So last thing here is this study, they quote, I'm not sure, I didn't read into the whole how they determined this number, this particular number, but saying that failure to take steps to educate the kids or whoever it is led to 24% of people having conflicts. Now, I'd be willing to bet a lot of money that failing to plan to discuss these things with your kids or whoever it is leads to conflicts a lot more than 24% of the time. For sure, for our, for our demographics, there's no question. To your no point, resources. maybe the average person, if they're leaving, you know, yeah. 20,000, 50,000, 100,000 split between three kids. There's not much argument. There's not a whole lot of conflicts to cause. But for a lot of our clients, if they're leaving larger sums of money, that just breeds conflicts if it's not taken care of very specifically. So they, uh, they assume, our clients assume, people assume that, not our children, they won't argue amongst themselves, but there's, outs there's outside influences as, as people age, there's outside influences, a spouse, children. There could be many variables going on in that child's life at that time that we didn't account for that is causing them to behave differently than you thought they would behave. Mm -hmm. So, I, Michael, we gotta wrap this up because we're getting long. But what this leads to, and, and so as our practice is aging, this is all centered around, and this is why we're starting to see more and more issues. As our practice is aging, there's a couple of notes that I know you wanted to talk about, is, is making sure the kids know there's a plan in place. Um, the, and, and, and I think for a lot of our clients, this almost is a built-in excuse to help their children begin to plan for their retirement of the mm -hmm. things they should have from a retirement plan. Because they're not seeing, you have something unique and special and different. Your kids aren't going to see it. The rest of the general public don't have what you have. You have something unique. And that uniqueness is helping to provide the freedom for you to spend and enjoy a retirement that I'm sure you would like to see your children have the same, similar to you have. And if they don't, they're going to make all kinds of mistakes with their own retirements and the wealth you're leaving them. Tax mistakes, income mistakes, living under their means. Many of them, when they retire, will way underspend mm -hmm. what they otherwise could have spent, just like you were doing before you came to our class and we taught you. I mean, how many people have we talked to who said, yeah, I did a good job between 45 and, and today, 55 or 60, whatever it is, saving, and I caught back up. But holy smokes, imagine how much I'd have if I started at 25 or 30. And they got and lucky. I didn't, and I didn't mess around with the actively managed mutual funds and timing stock markets and jumping in and out. Imagine what I'd have if I just stuck to the index funds and let the market do its job and, and saved some non-qualified money for Roth conversions. Yeah, I'll put some money in Roth. And didn't save it all in the pre-tax accounts. Imagine what I'd have then. Well, your kids can have that. That's right. So they just need to have the right seeds planted. That's exactly right, Michael. So um, the last thing about not communicating, not preparing, not planning mm -hmm. um, is elder abuse. And it's something I, you know, I've talked about a lot. I, I, I've gone on PBS and spoke about elder abuse. I'm on TV mm -hmm. regularly talking about elder abuse. It's, it's something that I'm really concerned about. Uh, new st statistics have come out. So we know that one in five are victims of elder abuse. Reported. Reported they are convinced it's closer to two or three in five are victims of elder abuse because so much is going unreported. And I agree because as you get older, you don't want to lose control of your wealth, your independence, so you don't tell your, you don't report well, it. Well, one, either you don't want to report it because you're embarrassed, or two, that 
it just goes undiscovered. Yes, 100%. So $36 billion uh, last year, just reported again, $36 billion was lost to elder abuse. That's a, over $40,000 per person in the United States over the age of 70. Mm -hmm. Per person. Not the victims. That's per every person over the age of 70. 40, it's a remarkable it's a number. It's a huge number. And then and read, here's, yes, read who does it. Yeah, this, and here, this here's part, the problem. This floors me every time I hear it. This is the problem right here. And this is why we are not going to let you do this happen. We're going to, because we have witnessed this a couple of times now mm -hmm. and never again. 58%, 58% of the abuse, the, the financial abuse of elderly is the family. 58% is caused, being done, perpetrated by the family. And when does it happen? It's when the first spouse dies. Mm -hmm. That's when it happens. Because one of the children comes in with their slick advisor or attorney blowing everything up. Why do you own annuities? This is crazy. But what are you doing? You're spending too much money. All these things, right? So elder abuse can come in a lot of different forms, Michael. A lot of different forms. And no one thinks it's going to be their kids that do it. But is it your kids in control of their home's finances? Or is it a, 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 a son-in-law or daughter-in-law controlling your family, the, 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 the children's household finances? There's influences, there's poor business decisions. It start, can start small and grow. There's so many variables we've witnessed well, and that's triggering what, this. So people think about elder abuse, financial elder abuse, and they think theft. It's not always just no, plain theft. It's, it's just not. misusing the funds. And it's so 57, 58% family. There's uh, home aids, there's friends on that chart. Yeah, it's there's 15% home care aids, 17% are friends and neighbor, and 10 are others. It's ridiculously high of people that are trusted individuals who are committing the elder abuse, for, um, the financial elder abuse. All right, we're running late, as yep, usual. We are. So, Michael. They say, I'll let you do the they say this week and I'll do the homework. So, <laughs> two things. One, they say, you know, I don't, I, a will is good enough. All I need is a will. Well, that's just not the case, especially for our average, the person we're helping on average, um, that one to $10 million person, a will is not enough. You need a trust. I don't care how simple you think it is. I don't care how smart your kids are. I don't care how well they get along. You, <clears throat> you need a trust. Um, a checklist isn't good enough. A checklist, they say, just leave a checklist for the spouse or the kids, not good enough. It cannot just be a checklist or a piece of paper and trusting, well, when I pass, they'll find this checklist in my list of things and they'll do these things. So Michael, today's homework, I feel like we're rushing a little bit now, but I wanna get into our homework. So today's homework is a two part. One is your homework, Some, one of it's our homework. So um, Michael, give them their part of the homework. So your part of the homework, if you have not already started this conversation with the, with the kids, the legacy, whoever it is, start to think about how you're going to provo provo uh, provoke this conversation or yeah. start to have this conversation. Yeah, so, so we've done this before, but we're going to do it much, we're going to be far more concentrated and we'll concentrate, uh, well, sorry, struggle to communicate. We are going to focus and put a lot more concentration into this project this summer, mm -hmm. okay? So we're gonna do this this summer. So we're going to create a couple of mini classes just for your children, okay? There's, there's two goals with this, all right? The first goal is a selfish goal for us and what we're witnessing for you. We're going through this a lot right now, so we want to avoid this. This is your children understanding that you have a comprehensive plan. The, 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 the class, the course will be one hour long and I'm gonna walk them through what mom and dad have. All of you have a comprehensive retirement plan with all the different variables and we're gonna explain all the things that have been put in place for the surviving spouse, for mm -hmm. the surviving mom or dad. Do not come in here and disrupt this when one passes away and take over things and blow up the plan that creates massive problems, okay? We're seeing this too much with a kid with their slick advisor or slick attorney coming in, becoming disruptive. So we wanna educate them about what mom and dad have, mm -hmm. okay? That's more selfish. Second part is for you, and what I know many of you have asked us to help you with your children. 
and that is helping to educate your children about what they need to have for a retirement plan. Mm -hmm. So the push, your homework will be, children, this is very important to us to communicate about what we've built for our retirement plan and what's gonna happen when we pass away. We need you to participate and watch this. It'll be hour long, we'll do it live and in person, and we'll stream it so people that are out of town can watch it. Mm -hmm. Then we're gonna put together a little mini series for the children, and we're even considering beginning to help some of, help our ch clients' children, and we're debating on how we're gonna do this, right? Because Very early stages of conversation. It is early stages, and the, and the goal is not for business for us. That is not the goal, because we, in, in many cases, we probably won't even charge them. We'll just put them on a path and a, a, a guide uh, a path. More importantly, to get them into our system, our network for you, so that when something happens to either of you or both of you, they can plug right in and follow what you want to happen for them and they have a plan after you're gone. That is the motivation, to set them on a path and then put them in a position to be able to receive what you're giving them so they're not disruptive in a problem for us or for you. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna work hard on that, okay? And I think that it'll be great for your families, you're gonna teach them many lessons, and the excuse to force them to this class is to do it for you. Mom and dad, I want you guys to know, I want my children, I want you guys to know what we have in terms of a retirement plan, just in case if something happens to mom or dad, so you know what's supposed to happen, that we're okay, you don't need to worry about us, we have all these things covered and protected, you're gonna be okay. So I hope today's was helpful, a little different than normal. Yep. Until next rundown. Two weeks, next yep. rundown. Yep, couple weeks. We'll see you then.